Hi there, it's Megan Mitchell, the founder of Agents of Change Social Work Test Prep. And today I'm here to bring you a revamped, updated social work shorts on a preview of some ASWB sample practice questions. If you are looking for more ASWB exam prep content, go ahead and head on over to our website at agentsofchangeprep.com. We really do have something for everyone from free to paid content, and we have tons of information for you to get more acclimated to be prepared to sit for your ASWB exam. So let's go ahead and jump into some tips for approaching practice questions. So practice questions, why are they so important? Content is great for this exam. You need to know content to be able to answer the questions correctly. However, Completing practice questions is just as important, and I would make the case that it might be more important than just studying the content. And why is that? It's going to give you practice. Practice, 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 practice. And for this exam, content is not enough to help you get a passing score. Not only do you need to know the content, you need to be able to apply the content, and you need to be able to utilize it in practice questions, in clinical vignettes, to help you piece together the information. So it's very important that throughout your studying you are completing practice questions. I 100% recommend completing at least one full length practice exam so that you are comfortable with the way the questions are worded, you're comfortable sitting for the entirety of the four hours, and so that on test day you have some practice under your belt. So let's say practice practice, 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 practice questions are going to be really helpful. I also want to preface it by saying, if you are taking practice exams or you're working through practice questions, a solid, good quality practice question is going to have a rationale as to why the question is correct or incorrect. If you are finding questions that do not give answer rationales, it's not a good question. You need to know why the answer was correct and you need to be able to use that rationale to help guide you. So you really need to make sure that you are finding quality, solid practice questions to work from. Here is my advice as you are working through practice questions. Read each question two times through. And you might be thinking, I don't have time. There's 170 questions. I don't have time to read each question through twice. Why do I suggest this? Because you're going to pick up on details that you missed the first read through. When we are in the testing environment, it's very high stakes. We might be more anxious, our adrenaline might be, you know, operating at a high level. So we might be more prone to rush. So if you read each question twice, you're able to do a sweep a second time to make sure you did not miss anything in the first read through. If you are someone that tends to rush or go fast through tests, um, so say you're someone that's finishing in an hour, an hour and a half, that's pretty quick. Slow down. Read each question two times through. See if you missed any details at first glance. And a lot of times I will have people get answers wrong. They go back, they reread it, and they say, oh, I missed that. I, I just was going too fast, and I missed a very important detail. Always ask yourself after reading the question, what is this question asking? If you're not able to understand what the question's asking, you need to go through and read it so that you do understand. And some of these questions can be longer, they can be dense, they can be confusing. This is where you really want to rely on some sort of breaking down question strategy. So here I suggest using the five W's approach that is an agents of change approach that we teach. And if you are looking for information on the five W's, we have a blog post, a podcast, and a YouTube video on it. So make sure you have some sort of strategy for pulling out important details and being able to synthesize information as you're reading practice questions. Lastly, read all answer choices before selecting an answer. This is also a good tip if you're someone that tends to rush. So you don't want to automatically say, I know the answer is A, I'm going to select A and move on. Every word matters on this test, and there could be the slightest variation in answer choices. So you want to make sure that you're reading all answer choices before selecting an answer and thinking about all of the answer choices. Similarly to how you 
pull out information in the practice question stem. And the stem is just the, the wording that is, is giving you to answer the, the practice question. You wanna make sure that you're equally spending your effort reading the answer choices before jumping to a conclusion, selecting an answer and moving on. Also, do not leave any answers un and any answers unanswered. You will get it wrong if you leave questions blank. So if you are stuck, make your best guess, but please select an answer because even selecting your best guess is better than leaving it blank. So make sure that you are not leaving any questions blank because those are gonna be points that you get off. So let's go ahead and do three practice questions together here. So we will go ahead and jump right in. I'll ask questions throughout. Um, and what's going to happen is I'm going to read it. I'm going to read the answer choices. And then I want you to put your answer in the chat with why you chose that answer. Okay. Number one, a social, this is going to be a medical question. So some people said that if you don't work in a medical setting, these can be really tricky. So this, this is just one that kind of asks you to know some basic medical terminology. A social worker is reviewing the medical history of a new client and notes a diagnosis of diabetic nephropathy. Understanding this term is essential for comprehending the client's health challenges. The term nephropathy in a client's medical history primarily indicates a disorder to related to which of the following? A, the cardiovascular system, B, the kidney system, C, the pulmonary system, or D, the liver system. And this is this is a basic recall one, but some people might get, for me, I don't work with a population where I would see this diagnosis, so it can definitely trip people up. So what kind of gave you a clue? If you did, if it wasn't a quick recall for you where you're like, oh, I know that, what was a clue? And how can you use the process of elimination? Okay. So I, there's not really a process of elimination for this one. It's either you know it or you don't. But if you're just trying to do process of elimination, there's nothing in the root word that would indicate this is a cardiovascular, like that's usually heart, right? So we can go ahead and exit out of that. It's nothing to do with the lungs or breathing issues. So that can be ruled out. So now we're either to kidney or liver and most of you chose correctly. It does refer to kidneys, um, working with the kidney. Some people said they worked in dialysis, so they knew what that was. And a lot of times, like even knowing the basis of some of these medical terms will help you. So it is indeed related to the client's kidney system. Um, so that was a recall. Um, either you you know it or you don't, but you can always try and use process of elimination. Um, yeah, someone was like, I didn't know if it was kidney or liver, but I knew A and C were immediately out. So that's also a good indicator as well. Um, eliminate ones that you know for sure are not correct, right? Um, and then how, why do you, oh, someone said the diabetes things, because oftentimes that affects the kidney system. So that's a really good clue as well. Um, if you were working with a client who has a medical condition that affects the kidneys, what might you need? What, why is that important for us as a provider to know that that's in their medical history? Remember, we wouldn't ever be giving medical advice, but why would it be important to just understand what that is and how it impacts the client? They might be on medications, absolutely, right? I would want to know also, this is important, how long has this person had this diagnosis for? How much does the diagnosis impact their life? How does it affect functioning? Do you need to refer them? Do you need to, to do collaboration with a medical professional? It could, we know things are tied together, so it could definitely affect all different areas of their life, right? We know that medical very much ties to all different aspects. So just things to think about if you get a question that refers to something that's outside our scope, 
but it does all come together to play a role. So it definitely, we you need to know that it can affect mental health. It can have an impact and we need to know um, more about it, right? Because that is, like I say, it's always a little piece of evidence that helps us see the bigger picture. Okay, now let's keep moving along. Oh, and someone asked, this is being recorded and you will have access to this document later. It will be on the study platform. So um, take notes as you want or not want. This is up to you, but you do not have to write it down word for word because you will have access to this um, a little bit later tonight. Okay. Let's see. I have some more people in the waiting room I have to let in. So hold on one second. I'll let them in. Okay, I don't know what's going on with Zoom. Here we go, five more people coming in there. Okay, let's keep going. Number two is a, I'm gonna say this is like a community question and I know some people really have trouble with these. So number two, a team of social workers is planning a new housing project in an urban neighborhood facing a housing crisis. They are debating the most critical first step to ensure the project's success and relevance to the community's needs. What should be the first step in the initial phase of community organizing for this housing project? So before we even answer the questions here, if you were looking at this question stem, what are key pieces of information that you would pull out? So like, what is this question asking? What is our role? Utilize those five W's. What, what to hear do you think would be important? Go ahead and pop that into the chat. Yes, there's some keywords, new project, right? That would be important. Critical first step. So that's kind of asking you what's the first thing to do, right? And then the initial phase of community organizing. So we're at the very beginning here. So you got to think of those steps of working with community members, right? And what's going on here? We have been asked to plan a project for what's the problem? What's the problem here that the clients would be facing, knowing the clients are community? Housing, there's a housing crisis. Okay, so what would be the first step in the initial phase of community organizing for this housing project? A, secure funding for the housing project. B, identify key stakeholders to recruit for the project. C, conduct a comprehensive needs assessment of the community, or D, establish a task force of engaged community efforts to lead the effort. What would you pick for this and why? What would you pick for this and why? Think. Remember, first, or you have to make an order of where you're going to start. So where would be your starting point and why would that be your first place? We'll give you all maybe 30 more seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and start using process of elimination for this one. Okay, so I always like to say, some of these will come later in the process, but they're not the starting point. And one thing that we would not start with is securing funding. Why would we not start with that first? We need funding, right? But why is that not the first step? We don't know what we're asking for, right? Like we don't have a plan yet. If you went to say, I need funding, usually through grants or through, you know, different donors, you need to know what's going on. You need to know what they're going to be funding, right? What are you funding? What are, what do you need it for? Who is going to receive the funding? What's your plan? So absolutely, that is what needs to happen later in the process. Um, why is D not correct? We would definitely want to do this at some point, establish a task force of engaged community members to lead the effort. Why would that not be the first thing that we do? Why 
we don't know who those community members are going to be to lead the effort because we don't know what that plan is going to be, right? We don't know how many people we need. We don't know like who is going to be the best person um, to join the task force. And we don't just assume anyone that is engaged is going to be the best person for a task force, right? Like there needs to be some more evidence first to understand. So D is out. And there was some um, in the way in the chat, there was some, some mixture on this. Do we do B, identify key stakeholders to recruit for the project first, or C, comprehend a comprehensive needs assessment of the community? Can we identify key stakeholders without doing a needs assessment? No, right? I mean, you could, but it's not going to be as informed as it would be if we did a needs assessment first. So doing the needs assessment is going to say, um, who are the key stakeholders? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? A SWOT analysis. Um, the needs assessment is really going to be the engagement and the assessment of what is going on, right? We need to know what, what does the community need? And then from there, and community um, needs assessment, they're pretty comprehensive and long, right? Like you'd want to make sure that you give enough time to get diverse opinions on what's going on. And it, and it takes definitely plenty of time. And then you have to analyze what the needs assessment says, right? Um, so this was one that C is the first thing you would do. What do you think you would do next? So we have our needs assessment. What do you think would be the second thing? Analyze that data, yep. Probably then identify who your key stakeholders are, make a task force and then secure funding. Yeah. Um, you, you need to know who you're going to have that's gonna be best to work on this, um, but we can't do that without the needs assessment. And I just want to note here, when you think of working with a community, what do I always say for those of you that have gone through the program is the biggest thing you need to remember when working with community. And it, it goes to the engagement phase. What do you need to know about working with the community? They are the expert, ask them. We're not making any decisions on their behalf. We need to collect data and their voices need to be heard. They have to participate in the process. Yep. Um, and that makes sense, right? They know best. We're just facilitating. Unless we are, of course, a member of the community ourselves, then we can give um, input. But if we are in this planning phase and we're leading up the project, we need to work alongside them. They are the experts. Similar to our clients, if we're working one-on-one, -on -one, they're the experts on what's on their lives, right? The community knows best. So um, C is the correct answer there. Does anyone have any questions on number two? Just a little minor nuance, but I always say if you're getting first questions, order them, right? And like for this one, you can't identify the stakeholders until we have a needs assessment. That's going to help us do the other things. Okay. This, um, a few people have been asking for medication questions. So here you go. And people have asked, do I need to know the generic name? Do I need to know the brand name? It could give you either. So um, just when you are going through these, it's important to know. And I can take this out. You don't need to, to know that. Well, now you do know that risperidone is an antipsychotic, but the test will not tell you probably what it is. So number three. A social worker is reviewing the case of Alex, a 35-year-old client recently diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Alex has been prescribed medication by their psychiatrist, and the social worker is familiarizing themselves with standard treatments for depression. Which medication, commonly described for major depressive disorder, is Alex most likely taking? So here we have the diagnosis, right? major depressive disorder. So you know that the medication is going to have to be what? An SSRI probably, right? Yep. So which medication is most commonly prescribed for major depressive disorder? A, aripirazole. I have no idea if I'm saying that correctly. Sertaline, risperidone, or met metformin. And for those of you that have been studying, um, 
this medication is a recall um, category. So you there's some tricks that you can learn, which is on the study platform, but they're really like you kind of need to just memorize them. So I say always wait to, to study medications towards the end of your studying because it's straight recall, right? Like you, you have to memorize it and there's no, th you can use the memory tricks, but there's really sometimes no um, easy way other than memorization. So for those of you that um, have used some of the study tricks for medications, what do you know about antidepressants? And it's usually the ending of the names. What do we know about antidepressants? Yep, they usually end in I-N-E or A-M. Yep. So knowing that, sertaline is the correct answer. Um, and these others can be ruled out. Risperidone is an antipsychotic. I believe metformin is for diabetes management. And does anyone know what aripropazole is? It's usually used like Abilify. Yep. And I'm probably not saying these correctly at all. Medications are so hard for me to pronounce. But um, even here, knowing just those memory tricks, you can use process of elimination um, to kind of get closer. We know that major depressive disorder, SSRIs are going to be the most common medication that's prescribed. Any questions on that one? It's kind of a you know it or you don't. And I will tell you, I have not the greatest memory. So I had to do flashcards for all of these over and over and over and over and over again, um, because they it was just very, very hard for my brain to, to remember some of these. And especially if you don't work in a setting where you're seeing um, prescription meds, like often it, it can be um, a little bit trickier. If you are looking for more ASWB study content, like I said at the beginning of the video, check us out at agentsofchangeprep.com. If you have any questions, you may email us at agentsofchangeprep at gmail.com. And as always, we want to thank you for tuning in. And remember, this test is hard, but you can do hard things. You got this, and I commend you on taking this next step in your studying journey. Thank you.